Rizlander. Rizlander. Utah. 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 Spain. Spain. <laughs> where? Spain. Spain? Wow. Welcome to Wyoming. Laramie. 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 Douglas. Douglas. Where are you from, sir? Where, where are you from? Oh, I'm from uh, outside of Riverton. Outside of Riverton. Cool. So we got some locals. Got some people from the country, welcome. Um, so the biggest thing that I'm here to talk about is the Food Bank of Wyoming. So for those of you that don't know the Food Bank of Wyoming, uh, what we do basically is we serve the neighbors um, who are a little less fortunate uh, or living with some food insecurity. Um, my biggest goal here today is to actually talk a little bit more about why uh, we want to locally source for the food bank. Okay, so our mission is to ignite the power of communities to nourish those facing hunger. So um, I've only been working for the food bank a little bit over a year. I'm the, food, the first food sourcing manager they've ever had. Um, Wyoming is the only state that doesn't have our own food bank. We fall under the food bank of the Rockies. But one of our goals, um, or one of the food bank's goals, was hiring me to help us become more independent. Um, to stimulate our economy when it comes to local food sourcing and then feed those and shorten that, that, that chain line. So food insecurity in Wyoming, one in eight kids experience food insecurity. 12.2% um, of the population are under the age of 18, um, 16 to 100 kids, basically. So that used to be a little bit higher and it's, it's actually gone down a little bit, which is great. We want to continue to see it go down. In Wyoming in particular, um, we've actually seen an increase in our elders. Um, one of the things that some of you Wyomingites might know is we have very proud um, elder folk who do not want to go into the local pantry. So we're trying to mitigate some of those issues. One of the things that I'm working on is working with local FFA chapters to do elder boxes um, where they actually go pick up the box and they drop it off, no questions asked, um, to help mitigate that so they don't have to go into town. Food insecurity is a lack of consistent access to food for an active, health, healthy life. Uh, so COVID, as we all know, was a time when people were really in need. The unique thing about Wyoming is during that time, it actually helped us realize and see the food insecurity that we had. So where do we serve? Can you guys see this all okay? Yeah. So we cover the whole state. Um, these little trucks right here, those are mobile pantries. So those are towns um, that either one, don't have a actual pantry where they can go into, so we just send a truck once a month, or there's such a high um, population of food insecurity, we have to send a supplement truck along with pantries that they have. We have 19 of them. The crazy thing is we have four drivers covering the whole state, and that's something that we're really seeing an issue with. Um, we're trying to figure out ways that we can hire more people, but also shorten that um, transportation and that's where I come in as far as local sourcing. So then that way, if I buy some beef here in Fremont County and I wanna keep it in Fremont County, I work with the local pantries, local processors, local rancher, and then we cut that transportation cost. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any questions on this? Cool. Oh, and the, this, this is where our distribution center is. We're in Casper. Um, I'm out of Lander though. That was one of the, the stipulations I made is if they hired me, I got to stay in Lander. <laughs> so I didn't want to move back to Casper. Um, we want to create another distribution center more on this side of the state, because as you guys know, in the winter, um, when I-80 closes, it's hard for us to reach uh, the population on this side that are in food insecurity. And that's another reason that I'm trying to local so uh, source, lo locally source, is so we can mitigate that challenge as well. So, um, in the fiscal year of 2023, fiscal year is from uh, June to June. Um, it's not the regular calendar year, just FYI for you too. Um, in case you ever ask. <laughs> uh, but we served 44, a little over 44,000 um, individuals. 22% of those people were served were children. Do you guys know the Hunger Initiative with the First Lady, Mrs. Gordon? So that's part of that program as well. So she does a backpack program where we use Wyoming beef to go into the food backpack program. And that's what we mean by sourcing locally. Um, we really want to start getting that beef from our producers to help them grow their herds or their production. 
And now I'm trying to also do that with produce and grains, which sounds funny because we don't have a whole lot of produce in Wyoming, but for what we do, we really need to stimulate that economy as much as we can. So total pounds, um, the Food Bank of Wyoming falls under Feeding America under the United States Department of Agriculture. Everything that they, they do is based on poundage. Um, they put it in the algorithm of meeting the need, the cost, uh, and then that way they can send and figure out, do we need more grants, do we need more assistance um, with commodities and that kind of stuff. So we got uh, 9.8 million, so we're close to 10, uh, which is pretty, pretty significant for the size of our state. Um, but we're hoping to mitigate that a little bit more by shortening that line uh, at the food um, pantries and that kind of stuff. If I'm going too fast, please tell me. Ah. So, um, we cover 97,000 square miles. We touch every county. So when it comes to covering that mileage, um, especially me for my job, so um, I've been pretty lucky the last two conferences, three conferences, I've been in Riverton, <laughs> so I'm in Lander. Didn't take me very long to get here. But um, starting next week, I have to hit Evanston, Sheridan, um, Cheyenne, Rollins, and Rock Springs. Because those are five places that are struggling with food rescue in particular, which is a program that we use and I'm in charge of. So trying to touch all of those in the next three weeks is gonna be difficult for me because of winter. Um, and I like to go in person because not everybody answers the phone. Um, or they don't, they dodge my emails. But if I just walk in in person, I'm like, hey, I'm here. <laughs> it's a little bit harder for them to run away. Um, so we have 150 relief partners. And what that means is food pantries. So that's where people can go in. Um, they, they do their shopping, some of it's from commodities, some of it's from food that I've directly sourced, um, and then some of it is actually uh, locally donated, which we're trying to do a little bit more of. To cut that cost for those who need it. So over 96% of the funding goes directly into our hunger relief programs and supports all of the ways we obtain food to distribute to our community members. So the first one is agriculture partners. Now, what I'm trying to work on is create more agriculture partners because in Wyoming, sorry, um, we do have a lot of opportunity to um, get more protein especially. There's no need for us to be getting protein from other states, in my personal opinion. And that's what I've been trying to drive with my coworkers and with the Food Bank of the Rockies. Nothing against Colorado, we don't need your beef. We got plenty of beef, right? So the agriculture partners is what I'm really honing in on here in trying to get uh, for local um, ranchers and, and producers. Purchase food, we always have to purchase food from commodities. So commodities is um, from the USDA, uh, from those big, um, Tyson, um, Tyson's the main one that we, we kind of work with. Cisco, we're, just, we're, we're trying to figure out if we want to work with them or not. Um, I want to stay as local as possible and not use those big uh, producers as much and, and kind of stay towards the family. Food rescue is a big one, and that's one that I do. That's one of the biggest concerns that I have in Wyoming. Um, how much do you guys think we waste a day on food, food specifically? 30%. Close, 30%. Anyone else? When you go to the grocery store, when you go to the restaurant, how much food do you think you're wasting? 30% is close. Almost. 40. 40, right? 40% of the food that we get, we waste. So think about it, okay? When you go to a restaurant and you're like crazy hungry, and then you're like, oh man, I got way more than I should have. What do we do? Say so we're gonna take it home. Yep, we say we take it home, we put it in a box, put it in the fridge, and then what? Come on, right? Leftovers, right? But that's what happens. So food rescue, what we're trying to do to mitigate that is we work with the local retail stores and some of the restaurants who follow the food safety guidelines, and we capture that poundage. So Walmart, um, Smith's, uh, Safeway, Loaf and Jug, there's a couple Loaf and Jugs, and one Maverick in Lander here specifically are part of that program. So when it starts to come up to that expiration date, instead of them tossing that into the dumpster, they turn around and they donate it to their local um, pantry. So then, the cool thing about that too, is it's free of charge 
for those individuals at the local pantry because it's not purchased. They don't have to break even or mitigate that cost. So food rescue is a huge part of that. One of the things I'm trying to tap into, um, and I hopefully did at the food coalition that we were at last week, is doing the same thing with the farmers market producers. If they're seeing that they can't um, sell all their production or something, I will either come in and buy that produce from them or they can turn around and donate it to their local pantries to get that fresh product. Because I mean, I know we all like junk food, but at the end of the day, it's nice to have some fruits and vegetables and, and some fresh protein as well to go along with that. So, distributing across the food, or uh, food, distributing food across Wyoming, we deploy 19 mobile pantries each month to rural communities throughout Wyoming to bring food directly to where it is needed most. Uh, what does rural mean to you guys? Actually, I know you asked me not to put you on the spot, but I'll put you on the spot. From Utah, what does rural mean to you? No, like rural, like rural. it's rural okay. country. I like rural. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, just like ag, like ag, you know, like smaller town. Mm -hmm. Smaller town. Okay. What else? What do you think, Emma? Like less than I would say ten thousand population in a town, or like outside of the town itself. I feel like there's a difference between like rural country versus like town country, mm -hmm. personally. Yeah. <laughs> but. Yeah. Yeah, but like outside of town, they have their own property. It's more not towards the middle. They're just like further away, I guess. So. Okay. For local people from Wyoming, would you count Cheyenne and Sheridan as rural? No. Why not? Aren't they considered rural? Just asking. I'm just asking. Just asking. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I'm asking. This is why this is why I'm asking this question. I would say Wyoming is rural. Yeah. yeah. Wyoming's rural. So I got asked to speak in D.C. on this particular issue because. All of Wyoming's rural, right? But when we think of Cheyenne and Sheridan, we're like, no, that's a city. What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't want to live there. It's a city. But that's the USDA has claimed that as far as rural goes, Wyoming is number one. Um, then, then it's Wyoming, uh, Montana, Nebraska, and then the two Dakotas. So when you look at that, one of the biggest challenges is getting that food to where it needs to go, right? So who knows where Ten Sleep is? Okay, so Ten Sleep is one of our areas where we don't have a grocery store there, right? Um, and the closest town is Warland, which is about 30, 40 miles away, correct? So when I'm trying to get fresh produce there from food rescue, it doesn't work. But what I can do is I can buy some local beef from a local rancher there, process it in Ten Sleep at the, what's it called, paint rock um, processor, and then keep that beef there. So that shortens that line and hopefully gets the food where it needs to go, plus helps that local rancher as well. Um, food for Kids is a big one that we're working on. Evergreen boxes, that's the elder boxes. So that's something relatively new here um, in Wyoming, and we're really trying to push for it. Um, you, this one, though, there is a little bit of paperwork because you have to go through the USDA. Um, there, it's a no-cost income, and you have to qualify and be older than uh, 60 years of age. This is the one where we're seeing an issue though with those prideful elders. Oh, I don't need no help. What are you talking about? Right? Um, so we are trying to work, work, work with local FFA members who um, know of someone in their community um, who might need that assistance and then we get them signed up um, for them uh, through our development team and then we would deliver that box to them without any questions, no anything, just drop it off, leave it and go. How we help, again, mobile cook pantries, totes of hope, evergreen boxes. Uh, one that I'm really proud of and working on is the Culturally Responsive Food Initiative. Um, so we call it the Curfew Program. So over here you'll see me um, at the reservation uh, distribution. I'm trying to get it to where we have more uh, buffalo, uh, more fresh produce, uh, that's culturally relative, um, but we don't just have Native Americans in the state. I know everyone thinks like it's just white and just Native. No. We actually have a huge population of Hispanic in certain parts of our um, state. So I'm learning all sorts of new things about culturally relative food when it comes to getting that food here in Wyoming because we don't get that production here. But we can still get that culturally relative food here and get it dispersed to where it needs to be. Because um, that's one of the biggest things that we've seen is we haven't had a huge response with the culturally relative food. And my goal is to, is to increase that um, by the end of next year. Um, 
I've actually got two buffalo coming this month to the reservation, which I'm pretty excited about. Challenges. A decrease in donations from manufacturers and retailers. Um, so COVID really made people think about food safety, which is crazy, because I'm like, everyone used to just donate food all the time. But then, people were getting sick, people weren't paying attention, they weren't keeping that cold chain when they donated those products. So now everyone's like, oh my God, I don't wanna donate anymore. What if someone gets sick, right? It's scary. So we've seen a huge decrease in that. There's also been a decrease in USDA commodities um, since the fiscal year 21, because the USDA is like, oh, COVID's over. So they cut that funding, send it to somewhere else. So now we're not having that um, supplement as much. But in my personal opinion, it's a great challenge because that means I can locally source more. I can hopefully stimulate our economy by doing that um, and increase our purchase and our donated at the local level. So we're actually able to, um, to kind of uplift one another to these commodities. Just kidding, we need commodities. But it shouldn't have to be as big as a pie as we want it to be. Also, we have seen this in Wyoming. Um, some people, um, I know there's a, the Wyoming Business Council um, goes back and forth a little bit on it, but we have seen an increase in cost of living um, across the state, not in just certain areas, but across the state as a whole. So what we're doing to adapt is we're picking up and delivering donations as soon as they become available. Um, I also tried to, it's kind of crazy, but I had a beef donation in Gillette, called the local ag teacher and was like, hey, do you have an FFA member who one, can drive, two, that you trust, <laughs> three, that can pick up a cow and take it to a processor? So then that way, I wasn't having to drive all the way over there or our, um, our trucks weren't having to drive all the way over there. We got it processed and we were able to distribute that there, cut the transportation costs out. Also, um, got to help that FFA member, just had to sign a little paper about how many hours that he did in driving that. So it, that's what I mean, like we just really need to help the grassroots people. Purchase more food. Um, in the fiscal year 23, we spent 900,000 more than budgeted just on food. We see that every year where we spend a little bit more on food. I'm really excited because we got, for the first time ever, we've got the LFPA, which is a local food purchasing um, assessment. So that means I have $550,000 to play with, okay? Which is really fun for me. <laughs> I've already spent 97,000. Um, freaks me out because that's the most I've ever spent. <laughs> but now I'm excited because I'm like, cool. I was able to help this rancher intensely, buy some of her cattle, help her production, plus feed people in that area. And that's, what, that's why I'm here talking to you guys. Hopefully in Wyoming, send the word of mouth, we can get a little bit more. Providing fresh produce for free to hunger relief partners. This is the tough one. Because what do we grow in Wyoming that's produce? Like on a mass level. Huh? Corn. Corn, but is it, is it all for humans? No. No, right? What else do we grow? I mean, we have some sugar beets in this area. What else? Beans. Yeah, beets. What else? Anything? Not really, right? <laughs> Not a whole lot of anything. But what we're starting to get, which I found out, which I didn't even know we had, um, but Sheridan actually has some pretty cool productions happening, which I just found out at the Mommy Food Coalition last, last week. This dude grows like, I don't even know, like six different species of lettuce, <laughs> which I don't know what that means, <laughs> but he grows a lot of lettuce. Um, so that's what I'm looking for, is how can I find those random little niche markets um, or farmers of that produce, get it, and then turn it around and give it away to people for free. Um, focusing on local food rescue is a big one. Um, it is challenging, so I'm a one-person team. I cover the whole state. I co cover food rescuing, purchasing, and donations. And that's why it gets a little crazy for me sometimes, and I always have to remember which audience I'm talking to. One of the ways that we've tried to mitigate this is we've created a fresh express route. So when I get to buy, buy produce, we try to turn it around as quickly as possible because we all know produce has a short um, shelf life, right? So if they deliver fresh produce more frequently to 50 plus hunger relief partners, we're only hitting 50 right now. Our goal is to hopefully in the next year, um, I might say two years, but hopefully in the next year we want to be able to touch all 150 um, relief partners. Pick up from local producers um, such as Vertical Harvest. Have you guys ever heard of Vertical Harvest? Um, they're out of Jackson. They have a vertical farm on the side of a parking lot. It's actually pretty cool. 
Um, there's a young gentleman who went to the University of Wyoming. He actually um, specialized in vertical harvesting. Went to California, um, critiqued his methods and, and all of his technology. He's bringing that technology back to Wyoming and is actually working for the University of Wyoming and starting to, um, I think they're starting to build the facility right now uh, to create that vertical harvesting and make it a little bit better. Which is great for us because um, we're hoping that they're going to partner with us and we'll be able to um, get some of their production. Region resiliency, um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this because it's not too relevant to like what we're doing, but the biggest thing, or the, what I'm doing, um, is we're trying to just capitalize on the capacity that we have. A lot of our pantries are either in the basements of churches or a closet at a um, rec center or something. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to actually build pantries that look like mini grocery stores. Uh, one, you can have a lot more um, produce in there. You, we, want to, we want to make it where they can have refrigerators. Some of our pantries don't have access to refrigerators or freezers. So it's kind of pointless for me to give them half a beef if they're not able to put it in a freezer um, and keep it for people to come. Um, but that's why we have the mobile pantries. It uses as a supplement for that. Um, we just have to make sure that when I send that beef to the mobile pantry, that they're actually taking all the beef. Um, and we don't put a limit on that, especially if there's extra. We let them take like two pounds or three pounds or, or whatever. So this is the big one, um, the LFPA purchasing. So under the USDA Local Food Purchasing Agreement, the Food Bank of Wyoming will pur purchase produce, produce and proteins from local and regional producers. Funds will help increase the consumption of local food <coughs> and economic opportunity for local farms and ranchers. The one challenge I've seen um, is I, I have three ranchers right now that I want to buy from, but they don't have the capital to pay for the processing, right? So what am I supposed to do? I have to call Amanda. <laughs> She'd have a big, huge barbecue. Yeah, that would be a big barbecue. That would be part of it. I'm trying to find someone to give them that line of credit. So here in Fremont County, the Wind River Development has agreed to give a line of credit to any rancher or producer who wants to be part of this. So they give that rancher um, line of credit, the rancher um, pays the processor, I pay the rancher, and then everybody's happy, right? The USDA has really great opportunities, but they don't think about some of these things. We're have, we've been having some huge issues with the processing in general. Um, we actually now have, well, we're supposed to have 12, but to my understanding, three aren't up and running yet as far as federally recognized uh, meat processors. You guys just became one, right? Yeah, we're doing one, but we're just up and running again. You're up and running again, perfect. So now we have 12. We used to have only like five. So we're, we're really excited about that. But because they're new and they don't have that relationship with that rancher, those processors aren't willing to be like, yeah, I'll take your word on it and I'll, you know, you'll get paid. I've even tried writing a contract um, with the food bank and saying, hey, just so you know, we will be paying this producer um, once we get delivery of that meat. But they still want that line of credit first. So those are some of the issues that we're having to mitigate on. Yes. What, have you had any uh, combination with the CWC in terms of their butchering program and that? That yeah. is me. That yep, we're working on that. I, <laughs> I'm here with it. So. Yes, and I think you guys are going to be taking the board for me, right? Um, is it from George or is it from who? From Jerry. Oh, yes, yeah. we need to, yes. Yeah. Your daddy called me. Yes. Yeah, so Sorry. we, yes, no, we are working on that. Yeah. Um, 307 Meats in Laramie. Um, he's worked really well with the Hunger Initiative and with the Food Bank. He is willing. Um, he, he's totally happy to, to process that for the producers without that money up front. Um, and so it just, that's what I mean, it just depends on the processor and that relationship. But he's had a really great relationship with the Hunger Initiative and with the Food Bank for a couple of years. Um, so and that's part of going out there and actually meeting them, having those conversations and trying to figure out what will work for them. So. The LFPA on how it works, key players are going to be producers. Protein, produce, and grains um, are what I'm trying to get at. Uh, does anyone know where we grow grain at in Wyoming? Everywhere. Everywhere. And where specifically? Is there like one place? Has anyone heard of Heritage Grains? Orland. Orland. Yeah, Orland and Powell. Okay. 
Orland and Powell are the biggest producers of our grains. Um, Heritage Grains is a really awesome um, family owned business. Um, I've never had wheat berries and I tried to bring some home to my dad. It did not go over very well. Um, he made fun of me the whole time because he was like, oh, there's wheat berries, there's no such thing. There's no berries on wheat, right? So what we're doing with that is Sensible Nutrition with the University of Wyoming is partnering with us. Because Vertical Harvest, they give us microgreens. Who knows what a microgreen is? They're delicious. Huh? They're delicious. They're delicious, but what are they? <laughs> fairly sprouted. Sprouted. Yep, fairly sprouted, right? So I went to Vertical Harvest, um, got awesome, like, I was just like, oh, cool, lettuce, right? No, not lettuce, microgreens. And I got a huge lecture lesson on what microgreens were. And I was like, I was thinking of my dad, and I was like, how am I gonna get people in Wyoming to eat this? <laughs> like, they're wanting to donate a third of their yields, which is a lot when it comes to microgreens. And I was like, I can't, like, my dad and my brothers won't eat this? Are you crazy? Like, how am I gonna, I, my little brother's in the back. But, um, but think about that, we don't eat salad, right? Or my, my older brother especially will be like, why are you putting spinach and stuff in your eggs? Like, get that, get that garden out of my food, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So I was thinking really hard and I was like, oh, I don't know how to do this. So we ended up partnering with Sensible Nutrition and they came up with recipes on how to use those microgreens, the wheat berries, um, and then she also put in like some beef and some chicken and made like a really cool salad thing out of it. Um, so that's one of the ways that we're trying to mitigate that is we're trying to use Sensible Nutrition as an education factor when it comes to how to use some of these. Because we also sent, um, we sent about I think it was 1,200 pounds of eggplant to Rollins, <laughs> and nobody wanted it because they didn't know how to cook it. <laughs> so we also had to go back and be like, okay, we got all this fresh produce, but now people aren't knowing how to cook it. Sensible Nutrition has really stepped up and helped us with that. Other key players are processors. So this is the one that I'm having a hard time with, uh, but what I'm doing is I'm going um, to each processor, talking to them face to face, trying to cultivate that relationship of, hey, this is not a scam, this is a real deal, we're giving the, um, the check to the producer, the producer is signing this agreement to then pay you. If they don't do that, then I'm doing what I'm doing with Wind River Development, finding that line of credit and giving it to there. Food Bank obviously is a, a key player um, with me. Uh, like I said, I'm a one-man team, so I travel all around the state. I'll actually be partnering with Bobby Lane. If you guys know Bobby Lane with the Department of Agriculture or Department of Education, with the Farm to School um, grant, we're going to be trying to talk to the ranchers at the same time, um, so we're not stepping on each other's toes. Plus the processors. Transportation is extremely difficult. That's why I've tapped into the local FFA members. I'm trying to get them to transport, and then distribution. So we take care of all of the distribution as much as we can. Um, if we can't find transportation, I work with our transportation team and I say, hey, I have five pounds of ground beef that I need you to pick up in Laramie. They look at their routes, they figure out when they can pick it up because what do we need to pick up that beef? Fresh refrigeration. Yeah, a truck, right? But a truck that has a cooler or a free system. Um, and we don't have a lot of those here in Wyoming. We actually only have two at the food bank. We have four trucks, or five, sorry, five trucks as a, as a whole, but only two of them are refrigerated. Um, the rest are for um, shelf stable and that kind of stuff. So those are other things that we're trying to figure out how to mitigate, how can we cut those costs, how we can make it a little bit more efficient. Um, but more importantly for me, I, my job is to go out and find the rancher, and it seems kind of like a lot and a, and a little bit ridiculous, um, but one of the things I do is I just drive to ranches um, and introduce myself because it's hard to get ranchers here. Um, I mean, I'm here because of my job, but um, I know it was a lot to get my little brother here um, and other producers, because things are happening at the ranch, right? You gotta feed, you gotta water, something breaks down, you gotta fix something. So it's hard for me to connect with those ranchers. So I'm talking to you guys to be like, oh, you got a ranching buddy? Cool, you should say, hey, I met this person who wants to buy 500,000 worth of beef from you. Because I have 300,000 spent on beef in particular. So. If no rancher is looking to sell some beef, have them call me. Huh? Word of mouth is great in Wyoming. It works a lot better than social media, I've noticed. Community investment. Um, everything that we that comes from the community goes back 96% uh, into our program. Uh, we try to keep everything that we get in Wyoming 
in Wyoming and stay here. Our why is about the people we serve in Wyoming. Um, we, so this gentleman is actually pretty awesome. Um, he goes to a pantry um, over in Rock River area. Um, he always shows up with his wheelbarrow to take a box for him and a box for his neighbor. Um, like, it just is awesome. Uh, the, the stories that you see, the people that you meet, um, he's a really shy gentleman, but he, he takes a box for, um, for his neighbor who's an elder. Um, and it's just cool to see the, the things that people do to go out of the way to help others. Ways that you guys can connect, you can volunteer at a local pantry in your local area, um, or you can help deliver evergreen boxes, volunteer in your community. If you're in Casper, or if you need to do a, a company retreat, um, or young college students who are strong and able and want to come and help, you can come pack some boxes. Uh, if you're here locally, we always need help on the reservation every third Monday, um, handing out food and that kind of stuff. Um, there's plenty to do, plenty of opportunity to get in, get engaged, and help. Corporate involvement, um, same thing. We've had a actually an awesome increase in corporate involvement, uh, especially from Wyoming companies. Uh, when we send out some of the statistics of what's happening and that commitment to the community, it's really nice to see those Wyoming um, businesses really step up and, and help in that corporate level. Looking ahead, um, the next couple of years, our goal is to ensure that all Wyomingites have enough nourishing food to thrive. So what do you think we mean by nourishing? What does that mean to you guys, nourishing? Fresh. Fresh, right? So you have an apple instead of like hot Cheetos. I like hot Cheetos. But, <laughs> but like it's, it's actually nourishing food because some of the grocery stores and stuff, um, they want to donate pop. They want to donate candy. And like, yes, those are fun treats and like the kids get really excited. But we want to actually have also access to good fresh produce and fresh protein that's from here that we put back on their, their table. Um, we're going to work really hard to do that, hopefully. So, do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Have you um, seen how that Bighorn School, we were talking about the company in Sheridan that produces all the different types of green. Have you seen the program, the school program in, Sh in um, Bighorn? town not yet they do it's yeah. really awesome I'm, I'm gonna be going up there hopefully at the end of the month depending on weather um, or the first week of March Cool. because um, I want to go I want to go see it and check yeah. it out so uh, you guys probably don't know what I'm talking about but the school chose to find more nutritious foods for their students because they would come home hungry they were getting the prepackaged foods the local producers the, the cattle ranchers the um, greenhouses all of this came together and they provide, um, I think it's a large percent, they may have to get sometimes some supplements, but they provide everything for their students for their meals throughout the day, yeah. locally. That's and so cool. it, it's a really awesome, the community decided to do this, and then the school had to make the choice to not get that government subsidized you know, income off of it, and then they wanted to charge the students um, not a lot more, so the families could still afford it. But the local community came, um, trying to do things like the best trying to do, trying to get that local fresh food into the school district, into those kids' stomachs. And then they learn how to like those products yeah. and then they eat healthy for the rest of their life too because they were taught that growing up and yeah. things, so. Yeah, no, we're really excited. I don't know um, if you guys know Denise You with Sensible Nutrition um, on the reservation here. She's doing some really cool things with, uh, she actually will get our recipes ahead that are in the boxes and then she will make snacks with the kids um, so then they know how to prepare that. Um, they know how to be safe um, around like knives and that kind of things. Like I think in the last one we had like carrots and apples and some other things that they were able to do. Um, one of the guys told a story about jicama at the Food Coalition, um, trying to get kids to eat jicama and they were like not about it but then as soon as like they helped prepare it and grow it, they actually loved um, jicama which I don't even know if I've had jicama, like I'm gonna have to like go try it now. But but that's that's how it is though, like right? Um, I know when I was younger, um, this is gonna sound weird, but like we grew up on spam a little bit. Um, so I actually love spam. <laughs> but my friends are like, ew, gross, how would you eat that? But it's a, like when I taste it, I think I'm six years old again. And it's, you know, it's just like a comfort thing. Um, or you going to the farmer's market or when down, we lived on the Navajo reservation, we called it the flea market, but like getting a fresh peach like from the flea market and stuff um, was really good and, and that kind of thing. So we want to try to build that at the 
the level of youth where they're not having candy all the time or hot Cheetos or Mountain Dew or like whatever it may be, right? Any other questions? Yeah. Do y'all try and work with like hunters and get game meat at all? Or is that like I want weird? <laughs> no, it's not weird. So there's, um, there's some red tape with the processing. So the way that I, I ask forgiveness rather than permission, um, the way that I go around it is I can be a resource, so I can help send that wild game somewhere without it touching the warehouse. So if that game doesn't come to the warehouse, I can say, hey, here's two local pantries in your area, um, it's up to them, and then I call the pantries ahead of time and say, you're going to have two hunters, um, especially the one-shot antelope in Lander that happens. Um, a lot of that gets donated back, um, which is pretty great. Um, so Stacy Stedner in um, at the Lander Pantry, she um, takes advantage of that. Um, the Hunger Initiative, the First Lady, what she does is she has the Hugh Foundation um, pay for that processing, and then that way it can um, the Hugh Foundation can then turn around and donate it. So there's there's like little ways to like find loopholes, um, but as far as directly, I can't. The only way that I've been able to get buffalo and elk on the reservation is using a um, using a grant it doesn't touch the warehouse I it has to be um, processed either at a the custom custom meat or um, there's a couple of them here I can't remember what the one's called here genuine. high country genuine. not genuine uh, it's wild game specific oh. okay. um, and then it gets um, transferred back now there is a new rule I have to figure it out um, but it just got passed um, by the USDA that you can do cultural harvesting. Um, so the reservation, for example, if they wanted to culturally harvest a couple of their buffalo on the Wind River um, Buffalo Ranch, uh, then we could turn around and use that and I don't have to have anyone there to inspect it. Now, I would kind of push that line and say cultural harvest should also be for Wyoming Nights who have hunted their whole life and their generation, but whether or not the USDA would agree with me <laughs> is going to be different. Um, but that's, yeah, because I, I think we're not utilizing our wild game enough. Um, we've actually seen, I know um, Mrs. Gordon um, has been trying to mitigate that because we've seen a huge increase of wasted wild game um, when it could be feeding people. It's an awesome source of protein. So, yeah, I know from the Wyoming Food Coalition, it's one of the things that we put on the policy list to be brought to the attention of legislation. So, whether or not that changes, though, will be, is another, another thing. Anything else? If you guys know anybody who wants to be a producer, or if you're a producer and you want to sell something to me, uh, come write your name down. I also have business cards um, if you guys want any of that. Good? Cool. That's your guys.